The Economist. It's been two and a half years since Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine. We've been reporting on the war since its first hours. By now, tens of thousands of civilians have been killed, millions more displaced. And today, for the first time, a special episode hosted from Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. I'll be guided by some of my colleagues who are more familiar with this war, with this country. We'll hear about the latest from the front lines, but we wanted also to give you another perspective, a fresh one even, about how civilians are responding. Because there's another battle being fought by every citizen to reclaim Ukrainian culture and identity that's endured centuries of oppression. And I'll be lucky enough to get a crash course in Ukrainian cuisine from one of the country's top chefs. I think, please don't be offended, no, no. what I have tried yes. tastes like dirt. Yes, is it exactly like this. You don't like dirt? This is my first time in Ukraine, and it's a lot. On the surface, life in Kyiv is seemingly kind of normal. Just below the surface, the collective trauma, the conversations, the rhythms of life, it's not normal. Russia continues to target energy infrastructure, so electricity comes and goes all the time. The sound of generators, small and big and really big, is part of the white noise of life. And most nights, there are air raid sirens. Explosions as the city's air defenses destroy most threats. Everyone here knows the sinister sound of drones that pass over, linger, pass on. And now I do too, having listened in the dead of night from the relative safety of my hotel bathroom. This is the soundtrack of a country learning new ways to carry on despite the constant threat. And to get a sense of where things stand with the war that's shaping Kievan's world, we'd arranged to meet with Oliver Carroll, a Ukraine correspondent who, until this trip, I'd only spoken to virtually. Hi, Oli. It really is good to see you. See you. It's wonderful to see you in the flesh. Welcome to Kyiv. Thanks very much. Where are we and why? So I brought you to Maidan Nizhelezhnosti, Independence Square. I mean, it's a part of the city that every Ukrainian knows. In the past, it was a place of fun, a place for concerts, a place for fairs. But more and more, it's become a place which is associated with revolution, the revolution of 2004, 2014, and a memory. And this see behind you, Institutska Street, is a place where hundreds of protesters were shot in 2014. And over to your left, you'll see this sea of flags over here. And that is where soldiers come and basically pay respects to their fallen. This is one of the very few places in Kiev right now where you really get a sense of the front line meeting the city. And we come to you quite often to get sort of piecemeal updates on how things have gone. Give me a more sort of high level view. Where are we with this war? You've been experiencing the last few days the reality of drones and missiles hitting the city. For example, we saw a missile hit Poltava, killing high-level military, it seems. For the last 18 months or so, this war has been perhaps mistakenly viewed as a kind of static quagmire. From 2022, when there was the first heroic repulsion of Russian forces in Kiev and Kharkiv, there was a sense here that really, with the right run of events, with nifty maneuver warfare, Ukraine has a chance of getting its 1991 borders back. But now things have become a little bit more dynamic again. And the population, it's exhausted. They've been to hell and back. I sometimes have this sickening feeling that actually things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. And you've been recently to the front lines in the north and the east. First of all, what's the feeling on the ground there? Yeah, so at the moment we're having a sort of competition between two very different operations. So it's difficult to say the feeling on the ground because the feeling on the ground is very different in these two theatres. The one in the northeast, where Ukraine is trying to take a piece of Russia and the main Russian effort in the east. But you go to the east and it is a kind of zombie land. You see towns and cities which are 30, 40, 50 percent, 70 percent ruined. And you speak to the soldiers there and they tell you about the, the terrain, this sort of lunar pockmarked terrain 
one of them talked about this pretty horrific image of uh, vinaigrette, a beetroot salad, which he said was this mix in the trenches with branches, rubbish, metal excrement and human remains. I mean, this is kind of pretty visceral stuff, grim. And he was saying your life there is so, so short that sometimes soldiers don't even say hello to each other. He says your fate is decided in the first few hours, five, ten minutes, sometimes that's all you've got. The eastern town's pretty much deserted, apart from military personnel and some stragglers here and there. And yet, at the same time, even there you find life. I was in Kulpinsk quite recently, which is to the southeast of Kharkiv, Ukraine's second city, and it's one of the main battles at the moment. Kulpinsk, because part of it is on the high ground, the bottom part is where a pretty strategic rail terminal is. And you come into town and the main strait is pretty much completely destroyed by Russian ballistic missiles. But in the middle, there's this sort of little kiosk, a wooden board which says uh, smash in the coffee, sort of uh, tasty coffee. And you think, oh, well, that, that must have been where the coffee shop was. But the window opens, this little bit of wood opens, and they're offering all kinds of coffee, uh, Arabica filter coffee with tonic water. Even there, people are trying to live to the maximum. And so where you're talking about there, Kupiansk, that is where the greatest concern is right now for Ukraine? No, Kupiansk is what they would say is the secondary effort. The main effort is around Pokrovsk, which is for many reasons a strategic hub. It's a transport crossroads, it's a rail crossroads, it's basically where an awful lot of the equipment and logistics for the eastern effort is going through. But above that, there's also an important economic reason for the Russians to be attacking Pokrovsk, because this is essentially an area where there's a lot of coal mines which are pretty essential for the country's metallurgy industry. And more and more we've been seeing that part of the Russian effort in Ukraine has been not just about invading a country, it's been about undermining their entire economic raison d'etre, their metallurgy economy has been an important part of that. Unfortunately, Russia, as I say, is making very rapid gains. The fall of the town seems a matter of time. Ukrainian defences are crumbling at the moment with no obvious reinforcements in place. And there's a whole variety of reasons why that is. Essentially, very green units have been put in place there. But also there's problems at the general staff level, and people tell me that the fortifications are very badly planned there. One officer told me that they simply aren't managing the process and there isn't even a plan. The, the real danger now is that Russia is getting behind fortifications and is able to attack Ukrainian formations from behind. And that creates the possibility of encirclements. And Russia is suffering from major losses in the process. But in the Donbass, the process very clearly appears to be in Russia's favor. And you mentioned also the Northeast and the incursion into to Kursk by Ukraine's forces, which seemed to breathe a little oxygen into their efforts. How does that look now? Yeah, this was a very daring, asymmetric operation where Ukraine was basically looking to show that it was worthy to be supported, that had the ability to take the fight to Russia, to raise morale. Ukraine went in with some of its best units and many people were worried and they were telling me at the time that Ukraine's teeth would be blunted and valuable Western kit, which they used, would be lost. We're now at the stage where that operation seems to be near culmination. And on some levels, it is a victory for Ukraine. In the first week, it seized almost as much territory as Russia had managed since the beginning of the year. According to the commander in chief, that's over a thousand square kilometers. Losses have been pretty light. Ukraine has also, in the process, got hundreds of political prisoners. Half of them, I'm told, are FSB security officers. It's embarrassed Putin. Perhaps best not to exaggerate that too much. But most crucially, as I said, it's shown that to Ukrainians and to Western backers that Ukraine can fight. I suppose the question right now is what the cost of that predominantly political victory has come at. And it's still too early to say because, you know, winter's about to come, soldiers are about to lose the cover of greenery. And already we're hearing a lot of grumbles from people who are trying to defend the Eastern Front, saying some of the best units went north. So clearly sending the best troops in for this possibly quixotic mission in Kursk it's a big gamble, was a big gamble. It certainly seems at this stage to be risky, to put it mildly, and there's a lot of grumbling happening already, and the mood is fickle, and while there was a huge mood uplift after the announcement of this cheeky operation into Russia, you see signs that it's also under question now. We may be seeing uh, another operation about to start. We have to basically wait and see on that front. But Ukraine's commanders see this as 
an essential part of a path to victory, maybe their last throw of the dice before being perhaps forced into a piece that might not be particularly advantageous to them or acceptable to the Ukrainian people. And as a Kyiv resident, do you get the sense that everyone here feels that kind of worry or is everyone still on the euphoria of, of the incursion? What's the fingertip feeling for Kievans? It really depends on the person you ask in particular. But what is clear is that the challenges of war are very different from those in Kyiv, especially those who don't have skin in the game with family members. Many of them do, of course. Uh, but, you know, with all the major problems of demobilization, post-trauma, disability, money, economics, politics, even if we get to post-war, it might be as frightening as war itself. Ali, thanks as ever. Thank you. So we're still in Maidan, and I'm going to introduce someone who's been behind the scenes here and will continue to be senior producer on the intelligence, Sarah Larnyuk, who's been coordinating this trip and keeping me alive, frankly, and who has traveled extensively in Ukraine since the start of the invasion. Sarah, what's the plan? Hey, Jason. So Maidan, in addition to being a cultural hallmark for the purposes of being the background to the revolutions in this country is also an easy access point to see that secondary war that's kind of going on. And by that, I mean Ukraine's cultural revival. It's fight to see what it means to be Ukrainian. So shall we? Do that. So from Maidan, now we're going down these stairs into hallways that largely connect big chunks of the city. And which have been acting as shelters also. Exactly. So these these hallways connect to the metro where people have been sheltering. It also connects into a mall. And the reason I'm bringing you down here is in fact because at this intersection of these hallways, directly under my dawn, you can always find Ukrainian musicians busking here. Like all the time. Like, pretty much all the time. Uh, like, uh, right up until curfew. Yeah. <laughs> Dusk, dawn, it doesn't matter. When the invasion happened, Ukrainian government put in place a lot of policies that helped support Ukrainian culture and reject anything in this country that would have previously been more influenced by Russia. So, for example, when the invasion happened, they banned Russian language music on the radio stations. And that's just, in addition to Ukrainian pride, helped boost this demand for more Ukrainian music, more artistry in not just music, but all of the realms. Early in the war on the radios, you would hear a lot of revivals of folk music. So this is like talking about songs sung by army men uh, in the early 20th century, Sikh riflemen who were part of the Austro-Hungarian uh, army, and they sing a song called in English, Oh, the Red Viburnum in the Meadow. Which talks about this plant falling, bending in a meadow, a metaphor obviously, and then says, for some reason, our glorious Ukraine is in sorrow. And we'll take that red viburnum and we will raise it up. So songs like these were revived, but then it, it really started advancing and it ended up being Ukrainian musicians writing new songs about the war. And then it just became more of a intrinsic interest in Ukrainian music. Like some of the biggest Ukrainian stars are, are touring not just in Ukraine, but also around the world. And is it easy to unpick what is a kind of uh, resurgence of, of patriotism if things like patriotic songs are being revived from the an actual cultural revival, or are those things impossibly intertwined? I think impossibly intertwined at this point. Ukrainian life now revolves around war, and so Ukrainian culture cannot exist untied from the war. And so to have culture which is distinctly Ukrainian is itself a, a war crime? Yeah. It's, it's, I think that I've seen a lot of response to this conflict and in the cultural revival, a, a desire to define what their values are, not to paint themselves as victims. However, 
it is in the context of continuous repression that is, in a big way, what it means to be Ukrainian. And so that's a very clear-cut case as regards music, but where else do you see this revival? So also in this underground network, you can see other cases of it because here in all of these little shops that pop up in this little network of tunnels, here you can see this traditional wear called the Vishbanka being sold well, alongside, everywhere. Well, alongside keychains and Ukrainian flags and what have you. Yeah, there's also a lot of war merch. Yeah. <laughs> but this is particularly the revival of a Ukrainian uh, traditional, uh, the English word is peasant blouse. And for a long time, this Vishvanka dates back hundreds of years again, but it was repressed. It was shamed to wear them. And really before 2014 and before 2022, you would never see a young person wearing a Vishvanka. So it is a long-sleeved dress, lots of embroidery up the center, down the sleeves. All have tassels, tassels hanging from the belt as well. We love tassels. Ornate. I mean, uh, so but. the embroidery is important. It always has embroidery around the cuffs and, and typically around the collar as well. And so these ones are dresses, um, but they're also shirts and they're also unisex. So there's male shirts and female shirts. Obviously, the, the dress ones are for the women. But this embroidery is something that used to be so specific to every region of Ukraine. And over the course of centuries, it was shamed. It became a piece of clothing that Ukrainians didn't wear, unless it was a much older person at, like, maybe Christmas. But since 2014, you now see Vishvanka all over the place. On special occasions, you see it just everywhere. I feel like I've seen President Zelensky wearing one. Yes, you've definitely seen the Ukrainian president wearing one. Uh, but you'll also see them just on the streets everywhere. Or this week is an interesting time to visit Kyiv because it just happens to be Ukraine Fashion Week. Went to my very first fashion show this weekend, which was simply bizarre. But it was interesting because, first of all, it was hosted inside of this cavernous uh, Ukrainian landmark known as the Golden Gate. And it presented clothing made by the Gunya Project, which very specifically is looking at modernizing things like the Vishvanka and, and making it into clothing that everyone is really, really proud to wear. I don't know very much about Ukrainian history, but I know enough to know that there have been cycles of, of repression and conflict and war here for a very long time indeed. It's sort of sad that this war is what's brought this cultural stuff back to the fore. It is a very sad silver lining to all of this. Um, and it's something that isn't by accident. So just to give you one last example, I, there is a place in Kharkiv known in the 20th century uh, as Slovo House. And it was just this place for artists to write and tell their stories and exist. And under Stalin, most of those people ended up being executed. But that house still existed when the invasion happened. And it was among the very first places targeted by missiles in the first weeks of the war. And so this is a repeating story. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance that goes on in my own brain when I go to a fashion show in Kyiv when most of the time we're talking about a war. But this feels like one of the ways that Ukrainians can fight back that actually allows them to come back to normal life a little bit and something that actually gives them joy. Sarah, thanks for the tour. Thanks, Jason. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hi, Jason. Jason, yeah, again, nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. I, I understand you are the best person in perhaps the world to tell me about modernized... Universe. Universe. In the universe. Yeah, tell yeah. me about like modernized Ukrainian cuisine. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So my, my name is Yevgen Klopotenko, uh, and I'm the chef of Ukraine who is changing the Ukrainian gastronomy, and I want you to understand what, what is happening. Okay. So I, uh, I'm asking you to enjoy my my cathedral of the best Ukrainian food. Cathedral of yeah. Ukrainian food. Yeah, Let's yeah. go. Let's go. Okay. So take a seat. Thank you. 
I, I know that you uh, don't like beetroot. Yes, you've been told. It is, it is almost the only food I don't like. Why? What is your story? <laughs> <laughs> I have to defend myself. Um, yeah. I think, please don't be offended, no, no. what I have tried yes. tastes like dirt. Yes, it's exactly like this. You don't like dirt? <laughs> <laughs> there is like a few different uh, tastes in the world. Like if you're describing some style of the chef, normally you're saying this chef working with a lot of ground tastes, like a carrot, like a parsley, all the stuff. I like all those things. Yeah, yeah, but mushrooms. Yeah, 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 sorry, uh, but is... beet is just like yeah, yeah, big dirt. You will uh, fall in love. Well, I think that's my mission for today. I am open-minded. This restaurant is 100% uh, of Ukrainian products. So we don't have here black pepper. We don't have here lemons, ginger, parmigiano, because for me it's important to show that in Ukraine we're now fighting for our identity and we want to find everything ours. You can have the best restaurant of Ukrainian cuisine from the best Ukrainian ingredients. That's why you ask about the spices. In Ukraine, yes, what is it so we have here? In Ukraine we don't have the spices and I was thinking what we have. And I, I understood that in Ukraine we, we preserved all the spices in the liquors. So we took the vodka, we called Horilka. So we, we made like infusions. It's the, our famous drinks. Infusions with different herbs. I just bought like a hundred of bottles of different infusions and I took from that infusions the all herbs. Like here is chamomile, edelflower, and this is the yellow pea. And with the smoked paprika from the West Ukraine region. And we have uh, fresh sunflower oil. Mm. And that's the taste of the childhood of all Ukrainians. Take a bread and do like Italians do with the focaccia and the olive oil. You will feel uh, the taste of Ukraine. Mm. That is unexpected, but and really nice. 100% of Ukrainian products, that's all. But just without the cheating, you know, mm. it's the truth. But it's a bit of culinary truth, but also a kind of patriotic yeah. truth. Yeah, yeah, my lifestyle is about showing the people that they can be 100% Ukrainians. If you want to understand Ukrainian people, you have to understand how, like, I was born in the USSR. And the USSR, it's a, it's a kind of an awful, awful thing. Like, you've been living in USSR for 70 years and you had nothing abroad. When the borders are opened in 1991, when the USSR was broke, and the, everyone started to think that everything which is from abroad, it was forbidden, and this means it is better. And my way, what I'm trying to turn it back. So the restaurant called 100 years back in the future. So we went back before the USSR came here. Mm. The result, now what you're eating, is uh, taking part now in Ukraine. So a lot of people start to wear the jewelries, which are Ukrainian. They start to, to have a lot of clothes, which are Ukrainian, because it's like a, some kind of renaissance. But now you have to pray, because it's borscht. Pray. Well, Right, because uh, you, you will have the most important food for the, our nation, and you will have the most important food for, for our nation from the beetroot. <laughs> from the red, dirty beetroot. Uh, giving the red, dirty beetroot a chance. You have to put the sour cream there, one spoon. Uh, as much? Yeah. Put and mix it. This one, it has the wooden oven flavor, because we have here wooden oven. Because all the food, if you want to recreate the food from the ancient parents, you have to do it how they were cooking. You have to build a wooden oven, and then it has this, the, the taste. So normally, it certainly has the smell. Yeah, and that's uh, the dish now is a part of the UNESCO heritage for the last uh, two years because my NGO, my organization, put it there because Russian people they want to say that it's their dish, and they start to tell in the world that the borscht is a Russian soup. And I had to fight back, and I, I won with my team. And now borscht is a part of the world heritage of UNESCO. And it's only 10 dishes there. It's a pizza from Napoli. It's a baguette from France. And pilav. And there is hummus. It's like a brick of your identity. And this one, borscht, is, uh, for us, is the most important thing. Clearly. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've been eating this the whole time. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, there's no dirt. Yeah, no, no. Because, no. Because uh, you were eating maybe fresh beetroot. It, it's, it, 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 I, I took the soul of the beetroot and I put the aroma of the wooden oven. But normally... The soul of beetroot tastes yeah. pretty good, actually. Yeah, soul of beetroot. <laughs> That's the secret. You will tell to everyone that I hate beetroot except in the borscht. My life is already changing. Okay, okay. <laughs> Nice. Your, 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 your work is done here. Yeah, yeah. You've converted me after a uh, lifetime. Okay. Woohoo! That's actually what, what she inspires me, and that's my, actually my job. Uh, like, what I'm doing for you to discover Ukrainian cuisine is very important also, because when you come into some country and you want to discover what is that country about, 
you normally you're listening for the language you're looking you're looking for the lifestyle and um, you want to eat the food you know and that's what you now you're doing you just this is much more accessible than trying to learn ukrainian yeah 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 definitely definitely it's much yeah, and it's more easy to learn and, and enjoyable can i say Thanks for making the time to Thank talk you. and for providing an enormous meal. It's a, you know, uh, I, I want you to, to try, and I think this it's like something new. And something very, very Ukrainian. Yeah, and that's Ukrainian. That's, for me, what's most important that you try it very Ukrainian cuisine, and you will remember it. We'll never forget it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. We're back in Maidan, and I don't know if you can hear the generator there, but again, it's part of the backdrop of life here. Uh, and I've come here for, for the hard parts at the end. Patting a full belly and thinking about where we might go listen to some traditional Ukrainian music tonight feels like we're looking past what's going on in eastern Ukraine. And the vibe in Kyiv can feel like a lot of people here are consciously choosing to have a more normal day-to-day -day existence. Again, it's not. And it would be really easy to be mawkish about what I've been shown, to talk about feeling the weight of history and the history being made here, to imagine I've parachuted in and understood the grief that, that is there just below the surface. I don't want to tell you again that Ukrainians are stoic or resilient. It's not enough. I've come to the field of flags that Ollie was talking about before. I was passing through here earlier this week. There's barely space for more flags, and as I walked past here earlier, there was a man with his family. He carefully stepped into it with a flag in his hand. And I presume his wife was holding a picture frame. And I guess the earth is really hard. He was struggling to, to get the flags stuck in. And just then a passerby pulled out a big pocket knife and handed it to the guy. And he dug a little hole and planted the flag and passed the knife back. Then the other guy just kept walking. I don't think a word was said. <laughs> 